everyone, it's Robert and this is Echip. And today we're talking about something that nobody really even probably gives a about, but thank you for joining us anyway. <laughs> the 1920s was a decade of unprecedented industrialization and prosperity in America. The country saw large-scale adoption of automobiles, telephones, motion pictures, radio and household electricity. There was an accelerated consumer demand and aspirations and significant changes in American lifestyle. Then in 1929, it all came crashing down. Along a lonely stretch of two-lane highway in northern Oklahoma lies the ruins of a once prosperous, roaring 20s enterprise that attained worldwide attention then slipped into oblivion. The Miller Brothers 101 Ranch once claimed to be the largest diversified farm in the world. The ranch got its start by Colonel George Washington Miller, a Confederate soldier who after the Civil War began cattle ranching near Baxter Springs, Kansas in 1881. While there, Miller made friends with the Ponca Indians, a tribe of the Sioux who were then living among their close cousins, the Quapaw. Miller encouraged the Ponca to settle in the available lands in Indian Territory, which they did. In 1884, Miller leased 100,000 acres of land from the Cherokees in Indian Territory and dug out a home and ranching headquarters along the bank of the Salt Fork of the Arkansas River alongside the new Ponca Reservation. The 101 Ranch, as it became known, was one of the largest cattle ranches in Indian Territory with the ranch land eventually encompassing three towns. The Millers would buy and drive Longhorn cattle from Texas to their ranch, fatten them, and ship them to market in the eastern U.S. But the opening of Indian Territory for white settlement in 1893 and the transfer of tribal land to individual ownership spelled the beginning of the end for large cattle ranching in Oklahoma as fences divided up the land. The push to diversify the ranch's activities sent the 101 in the most fascinating directions. Cattle, corn, and hogs form the backbone of the 101 ranch's income. But upon Colonel Miller's death in 1903, his sons expanded the ranch in dramatic ways. Oil was discovered nearby, marking the beginning of the richest era of oil production in U.S. history, with the nation's largest and most productive oil fields within just a few miles of the ranch. The ranch bankrolled this new energy development, including Wildcat Oil and Gas Wells, founding the 101 Ranch Oil Company, which evolved into what we know today as ConocoPhillips Oil. By 1926, the ranch headquarters had pretty much become its own town, with a cafe, novelty shops, and several attractions. The farm produced beef, pork, corn, wheat, apples, cotton, and alfalfa had its own cider plant, and made apple jelly. The ranch mess hall and cafe were provisioned by food grown on the farm. The ranch had schools, churches, its own network of roads, a telephone system, and even a horseback delivery mail system. It had its own power plant and rail spur. Besides the oil and gas wells, the ranch owned trains, gray barbers, a cannery, tannery and packing plants, poultry farms, woodworking shops, and a general store that accepted U.S. currency or 101 ranch scrip and coins made of brass and copper. At its height, the ranch employed 1,700 people. The youngest brother, Zach Miller, stated in an interview for American Magazine in 1928, We figured it wasn't much harder to do things in a big way than it was to worry along in a small way. We figured it was no worse to fail big than to fail little, but ever so much better to win big. And for a short time, they did. In 1905, the ranch hosted a gathering of the National Editorial Association. Two years before Oklahoma statehood, 50,000 people descended on the ranch to view the 101's first Wild West demonstrations. Observing its resounding success, the Millers were quick to capitalize on the interest at the time in all things Wild West. With its proximity to Native American tribes, a large captive employment of ranch hands, and in the age of traveling circuses, the Millers created the Miller Brothers 101 Ranch Wild West Show, which performed for audiences around the world before and after World War I. 
It competed with the Ringling Brothers Circus, Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West, and Pawnee Bill's Wild West shows. In its heyday, the 171 square mile ranch received 100,000 regular visitors each year, not including those who attended the Roundup shows. Most visitors arrived at the ranch by train from as far away as Washington, D.C., pouring from the railroad spur on the ranch. Teddy Roosevelt, Warren G. Harding, Admiral Richard Byrd, John Philip Sousa, William Randolph Hearst, and John D. Rockefeller were all visitors to this very interesting ranch in the newly formed state of Oklahoma. The ranch was also a pioneer in cinema. As Wild West show attendance steadily fell during the 1920s, the Miller brothers again diversified by adding motion picture production to their enterprises. The first movie westerns were produced by the Miller brothers in what is now Hollywood. Later, whole movie companies were transported to the ranch in Oklahoma to make movies. William S. Hart and Tom Mix were employed as 101 ranch hands prior to their movie careers. Ranch visitors were surprised to see camels, elephants, and ostriches being herded by cowpunchers. One favorite attraction was the ranch's own black bear, Tony, who for five cents would instantly gulp down a bottle of soda pop. The bear eventually died of kidney failure in 1931. But by 1931, the 101 was busted. After Colonel Miller died, neither the ranch nor the Wild West shows made a profit. The crash of Wall Street's stock market in October 1929 dealt a further blow to the ranch finances, leaving the last Miller brother, Zach, hanging on just barely. By 1932, he had to face the inevitable and an auction call rumbled across the once mighty 101 ranch as the cattle, buffalo, horses, and hogs were sold. The U.S. government seized the show's remaining assets and bought 8,000 acres of the 101 Ranch. Completely broke, the 101 Ranch's last show closed after the New York World's Fair in 1939. So what is the lesson to be learned by the 101 Ranch's history and demise? How did the world's greatest diversified farm fail? Was it poor management? Was it the Great Depression? Was it changing times? Was it excessive debt caused by greed? Or was it a combination of all of these? Hey, thanks for getting this far into the video. Um, this is sort of a follow-up to a video we did. I think we entitled it, This Couple Will Change Your Mind About Homesteading. We've been thinking a lot about homesteading, as you can tell, and uh, how to go about it uh, safely, profitably. Prosperously. And, and prosperously. <laughs> And uh, so one of the things I thought of was the 101 Ranch here in Oklahoma because it is sort of a case study uh, for homesteaders, or I think it ought to be, uh, because here we're talking about a family who literally staked their claim in Oklahoma soil during a land run. They were there before that, leasing land, but they literally staked their claim as homesteaders. They dug a dugout home in the bank of the river. They went from a cattle operation to what people call the world's largest diversified ranch, uh, or diversified farm. And I mean, this thing had everything. You know, it was like, maybe like the Oklahoma version of Disneyland in its day, it seemed like. But uh, we'd like to know what your thoughts are on this, because one of the things that struck me was that quote earlier in the video by Zach Miller, where he said, you know, we figured... We figured if we failed, it was it would be just as painful to fail big as it would be to fail small. But on the other hand, if we won big, well, then that would be huge. And I'm not sure I agree with that. What do you think? But the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. The one thing I think of is today's little mantra of it's too big to fail. Maybe it got to be that kind of a mindset for the family, the Miller brothers, and maybe... They were just gung-ho, and as he said, losing's losing, so it doesn't matter if you lose big or lose small. But you know, in this case, it did make a difference. I mean, losing big hurt a lot of people. Mm -hmm. This was the 1920s, the roaring 20s, when everybody was spending, 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 and they didn't care if they racked up debt. They were literally told that, if the, that the stock market is so hot that if you that you should go into debt, you should take out a loan 
and with that money, buy buy stock. Oh, what was that called? It was called the margin. Yeah, You're buying margin on the buying. Margin. Yeah, yeah, that was buying on the margin. margin and, buying. and that was what was largely <laughs> responsible for the crash. And I think the Miller Brothers did the same thing. They were borrowing money on things that they didn't really fully own. And um, it all eventually came crashing down. I mean, it got to the point at one time, I think in 1930, when their Wild West show was literally stranded in Washington, D.C. It had run out of money. And the whole crew, the baggage trains, the wagons, the tents, equipment, everything was stranded and held. The cast and the crew of that show were literally relying on charity in Washington, D.C., the good graces of people, uh, to take them in, to feed them, and things like that, because the thing had no money. What is prosperity? Is prosperity all, always mean growth? Does, does prosperity only mean financial or economic prosperity, or does it mean other kinds of prosperity? I don't consider them to be very prosperous myself because they were running so much debt. Technically, yes, they were a prosperous institution, they were a prosper prosperous family, but with that much debt, you know, you're always chasing your losses. People want to make money quickly, easily, and with as little work as possible. Thinking that growth, you know, was going to get them out of debt, and really, I mean, that can help, but I mean, for the most part, the only way you can get out of debt is just to pay it. Right. You just got to pay it. Some of the things that they invested in ended up being short-lived kinds of mm -hmm. endeavors that ran their course. And then they had had all of the money involved and then were unable to pay it. Mm -hmm. But then again, the depression hit, the stock market crashed and all of that. And that big snowball effect. So was it bad luck? You know, I mean, what was it? I, to me, it just seemed like they way overextended themselves. But, you know, that's how we do. In this country, we overextend ourselves. Uh, there was just uh, too much chance taking, and uh, it just wound up in government hands and a receivership. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and all that jazz.